been an entrepreneur himself you know two startups one in the online education space uh, and you know he is an alumni of uh, harvard business school so uh, uh, like i told you i'm not going to do justice to your introduction here so uh, without further ado uh, please uh, welcome arindam you know thank you so much for taking the time to uh, uh, be with us today and uh, i hope you guys will uh, you know ask him a lot of questions All right. Uh, a very good evening to all of you guys. Uh, how are you guys doing? All right. Uh, how long have you been sitting in the classroom? It just helps me understand the part. Since 9 a.m. Okay. Okay. So I really need to do a good job to keep you guys awake. I'll try my best. Uh, but thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, uh, love to kind of speak uh, to all from budding uh, product managers and product leaders as well. Um, so I just thought I'll just talk a bit about uh, what we do at Flipkart and we incorporate a few of my learnings as well. A uh, few things which we expect out of product managers and product leaders and uh, hopefully that will give you guys uh, some better idea and we'll throw it up for questions as well. I usually like to uh, have more interactive sessions so feel free to stop me, feel free to ask me questions as well um, and I think that's that's what makes it a lot more engaging. All right, cool. Um, before we start though, like if I can get a quick sense from all of you guys, what you guys are expecting from the session, uh, it will help me, otherwise I will just keep blabbering and you guys will fall asleep, so I don't want that to happen. So quick uh, shout outs of what you guys are expecting and I think that will be great to start off. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yes, product, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. And to add to it, to it uh, maybe. Fair? Okay. Okay. Personal. Okay. Okay. Fair. How the life of a product manager is a flip card. Okay. Fair. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sure. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm just coming from a product manager hiring drive, so. Yeah, so we are definitely hiring and hiring pretty aggressively. Uh, cool, I think that gives me a very good sense to kind of start off. Uh, so quick uh, introduction about myself, uh, been with Flipkart for close to four years now. Um, I lead the user experience, user engagement, design and user research teams at Flipkart. Uh, so user experience is in all the channels like desktop, mobile apps, mobile web, all the ones that you use to browse hopefully. How many of you guys use Flipkart? Or, okay. I was expecting to see all hands, but surely we have some more work to do. Uh, uh, so yeah, so all the channels of communication there uh, and all the category experiences therein. Um, on the engagement side, we're trying to go after two major problem statements. Um, if you're not in a shopping mode, how do I get you back to Flipkart? Uh, because not everyone is in a shopping, sorry, is that a question? Sorry, you're raising your hand. Sure, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so on the engagement side, two problem statements. One is uh, knowing the fact that not everyone is in a shopping mode every day of the year. How do I get you back to the Flipkart, uh, to the Flipkart platform even when you are not in an active shopping mode? The second is uh, how do we know more about the user uh, in order to give you more relevant and engaging experiences, right? Um, so that's what I do uh, at uh, Flipkart. Before this stint, uh, and th in this stint I've been around for about a couple of years and before that I was leading the pricing and the offers platform. So if you have enjoyed the offers that Flipkart has uh, had for you, uh, I think you can definitely, uh, I'll pass on the kudos to the team. Uh, but yeah, all the offer formats, all the pricing pieces, all of that. Uh, and uh, before Flipkart was in Boston for five years, uh, when there for my business school, 
uh, then started working in the RFID space with Avery Denison, a small uh, group of four people. We are trying to set up a new business unit in a Fortune 500 company, so it has its own set of challenges and learnings. Wonderful experience, uh, didn't work out uh, because of the long sales cycle and uh, the company wanted to wanted me to move back to Ohio. For those of you who have been to the US, you know Ohio is kind of in the middle of nowhere, I didn't want to land up there. So Boston is a very favorite city of mine, so I wanted to stick around and I uh, wanted to get back to what I enjoyed doing, which was uh, building out products and at scale. Uh, TripAdvisor happened to uh, have that kind of an opportunity and shifted to TripAdvisor. At TripAdvisor, I think I've covered a breadth there, uh, all the way from mobile apps to search and in between revenue optimization and social and a bunch of usability stuff as well. Very good experiences over the last over those couple of years, and then relocated uh, to Bangalore again to join Flipkart. Right, so that's pretty much what my story has been so far. In the past, though, I've kind of uh, had my share of failed startups as well. Uh, one uh, was uh, Green Hat Ventures uh, back in 2008, and the world was kind of crumbling down. In fact, uh, we incorporated our company the very week that uh, Lehman Brothers went down. So <laughs> you can understand the situation we were in. Uh, very good learnings though, again uh, how to kind of scale up uh, from zero to get to a break even stage, uh, very good uh, learnings there. And also um, while in Boston tried to attempt uh, another one uh, in the social movie recommendation space as well, which was Flick Street. Again didn't kind of pan out primarily because of the business model not working out. Right, so that's pretty much what my story has been over the last few years. Um, so. Coming back to what I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about uh, at Flipkart again, when I joined Flipkart, just to set the context, uh, when I joined Flipkart around uh, June 2014, uh, the entire product group was about 25 to 30 product managers, right? Uh, right now we are at about 140, right? That's how Flipkart has grown. Uh, and obviously when an organization grows, right, there are growing pains as well. Right, so we want to kind of really focus on certain key competencies that we expect product leaders to demonstrate. Uh, I want to kind of bring that forward and hopefully that will also give you a flavor of uh, what product, product managers are supposed to do in kind of uh, growth companies and or in companies which are seeing scale. Okay? Um, so first one, um, empathize with the customer's pain. Right? Um, I think it's easier said than done. Right. Uh, if I ask you today, like when you use Flipkart, right, I'm sure it's not a very seamless experience. I know that, right. And uh, the thing here is to kind of really be able to go deep to understand why the user is facing a problem. What are the user's motivations? What is the job that the user wants to get done when the user is coming to Flipkart, right? And am I being able to help the user here, right? So empathy is a very core skill set that we look at and um, it doesn't come very naturally to a lot of folks, right? And uh, which is very, very important for us though as, a pro as product managers because if you're not able to empathize with the customer's uh, problem, you wouldn't be passionate about the problem, right? And we want people who are passionate about solving a problem, right? Because product managers at the end of the day are problem solvers. Right, that's how I define product managers. Right, uh, flashier explain uh, definitions, maybe CEO of the product, this that. For me, uh, product managers are problem solvers. Right, who are excited about the problem, and you wouldn't be excited about the problem if you cannot empathize with the customer's pain. Right, uh, but also keeping in mind that if you ask around in this room, even though they are kind of customers as well. I perhaps wouldn't limit myself to only this room, right? I'll have to go beyond. I cannot just see how I am behaving and the pain points that I am seeing and try to solve for that because I am not the typical customer many a times, right? Uh, the actual customer might be very, very different, right? If I think about a tier two, tier three, tier four city uh, user, their motivations are very, very different than mine, right? Um, their digital literacy might be very different than mine, right? Uh, so how do I actually bake those things in? It's very, very important because sometimes we fall into that trap, oh, I'm facing this problem, the other users also might be facing that problem, right? Not true, right? Very different kind of user bases, right? So we need to always keep that in mind. 
So that's the first, very, very first thing to start off with. You need to have that empathy. Classic trap for product managers, right? Uh, happens time and again, right? Even in interviews, right? Uh, give them a particular problem statement, they'll jump to the solution, right? No, that's not what we expect. As I said, problem solver, right? A problem solver first defines the problem, right? Uh, being able to understand that problem is half the job done. If you haven't understood the problem very deeply, you actually cannot even come up with the right solution. 99% of the time that wouldn't happen, right? The first step is to be able to understand the problem, define that problem, right? And then figure out how to break down that problem into smaller components. Right? Example, if I'm trying to kind of, so same example that I quoted, which my team is working on right now. How do I get users who are not in an active shopping mode back to Flipkart? Right? That's what I've defined. It's very vague. Right? Now, would you be able to run with this? No, I'm not expecting you to. You need to question, figure out, okay, when you say not in an active shopping mode, what does that mean? Right? Figure out from a customer journey point of view, which phase are you actually talking about? Is it even the post-purchase after the order has been delivered or one month after the purchase? What exactly is the phase that we are talking about, right? So very, uh, like being able to kind of uh, in a very specific manner define the problem statement goes a long way in terms of solving that problem as well, right? Um, and even in interviews today also, I saw that same thing happening, right? Uh, question being asked and people are jumping to the solution. Oh, I can actually do this, I can do that. Fair enough, before the solutioning, let's make sure that you know exactly what you're going after. Right? Uh, the third thing, right, as product managers, the life of a product manager involves some firefighting pretty much across the board, right, I wouldn't deny that. But if you're in a continuous firefighting mode, then something's wrong, something's wrong with you, right? Uh, that means you haven't taken a step back to actually figure out, hey, there's something else wrong, right, which I need to fix first because otherwise my my time is kind of getting spent in kind of just firefighting, right? It's not scalable at all. So just to give you an example, when I joined Flipkart, right, and I was asked to lead the uh, offers platform. In fact, before that, I'll take I'll tell you an interesting story. Like when I joined Flipkart, uh, my manager told me um, that uh, Arindam, there are two roles. Uh, tell me which one interests you more. One was uh, called Decide and Engage, right? And one was called Santa, right? And I had no idea what those two meant, right? Decide and Engage, I was coming from TripAdvisor, so I felt like, okay, maybe around that, uh, that reviews ratings kind of a space, but turned out that that was the intent. Santa was the offers platform, right? Uh, very nice name, I'm very fond of that name, but uh, that was the thing. And I asked him, like, Tell me which team has how many engineers, right? So decide and engage has zero. This one has five. I said, okay, I'll go with the one which has five, right? Uh, because if you don't have engineers, I cannot build, right? So it's very clear. Uh, so that's how it started. And then my very first week, right? I saw like people were just coming to my desk, right? Category managers one by one. Like my entire day was just attending to them. It's as if like uh, there's a bureaucrat sitting in the office and they're just coming to me to kind of getting something done or this is broken, that is broken and so I like, hey, is that how this company runs? Like a product manager, I'm supposed to build product, I'm attending to people like just coming one by one. So they're like, yeah, that's how it is. I was like, okay, let me try to understand why are they coming, <laughs> right? And figure out like, okay, there are so many things that are broken because they are not able to use the system, right? There are certain things stuck. Right, which is why their business is getting kind of uh, disturbed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, within the first month, uh, it became very clear to me that this is a platform which is not built to scale, right? And I told my manager also, right, uh, that hey, this is not built to scale. Uh, we need to rethink. But at that time, it was kind of July of this time frame, and 2014 was the first time we had our big billion days, right? So I was thrown into that fire as well, uh, big billion days planning and I was, I had no idea what's going to happen, very sure that something bad is going to happen, right? Uh, because I had seen one world at TripAdvisor which was very structured, very agile and on this side I was seeing like everything unstructured, right? Uh, but again, two different stages of the company as well, right? 
big billion days 2014 happened massive massacre if you guys remember what happened uh, we broke down and we crashed badly there was an apology letter from uh, Sachin and Vinny and I told my manager I've had enough All right for the next six months I'm not going to ship out any new feature I'm just going to build this platform again from scratch All right uh, because it's impossible to be firefighting always, right? And that's the thing that you need to kind of have, right? Because as a product manager, if you are always firefighting, then you're not actually building a product for scale, right? So there's something else is wrong which you need to figure out. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it requires, if the big billion days 2014 hadn't happened, right, maybe it would have been a much more difficult sell for me, right. Uh, but now that it happened, people knew that, okay, the system hasn't been built to scale. And not just my system, it just helped. So you need to find out those triggers. See, again, when you're working with different stakeholders, right, each one has certain motivations, right. The moment you understand what that motivation is, it's easier for you to talk in that language, right. Uh, and that's the classic selling model as well, right? When a salesperson also comes and sells to you, the best of salesperson will, will try to kind of position it. First, try to understand the problems that you're facing and position your product in a way that it solves your problem, right? That's, a, that's how you sell really well, right? And that's how it happened for me as well, right? So you need to find out those trigger points, right? And what the motivations are. This is kind of another important uh, part as well for product managers, right? Uh, I think most of the time that I spend, right, is here, right. Like I really spend my effort in the very first 10% of the journey, right, which is the time wherein I'm aligning people, I'm aligning stakeholders, I'm aligning my engineering team, etc. You see, they're not excited, right, by what we are building, then the rest of the journey will be kind of always having a lot of questions back and forth, this and that, that and that, right. I need to make sure the teams are also self-serve, right, because my major role right now is to kind of really lay out the vision and get people excited, right, about what we are trying to build, right. The other day I was showing them, how many of you guys use Snapchat by the way? I was expecting this response because you are not the target audience for Snapchat, but anyway. Uh, if you haven't, uh, give it a try, right? And you'll see some of the things that they've built and classic things, right? Uh, today, maybe you guys use Insta stories or Facebook stories a lot more and everyone's doing the stories. Snapchat actually started off with it. If you use Snapchat's lens feature as well, like classic uh, stuff, right, that they've done. I was just showing it to them. Like, imagine us having a video stream of the, uh, of uh, a product launch event in a full screen mode, portrait uh, mode, right, in a very seamless manner, even on a 3G network, right, and that got them excited when they saw it, right, they're like, oh my god, like, this is cool stuff that they've built, right, and those are, those are the things that you need to do to excite people, right? the moment they are able to visualize, there's some people who, are, who, who, once they visualize, like, thousand bulbs go and they uh, go off on their uh, in their brain right and if you understand what motivates or what excites people right you can actually think about how to bring those in front of those users right so this is an uh, a very very important part i've seen this getting ignored quite a bit uh, by uh, product managers because they will say okay i've run the i've d done the product requirements doc now it's your job to build it no it's not if you have not been able to excite the team about why we are building it, what is the differentiating factor around it, right? What is the, because engineers also get uh, really excited by the technical challenges, right? Because they, they really want to kind of figure out that they can actually solve it, right? That's what excites them, right? So you need to kind of give them that dose. Um, as product managers also, I think uh, I always uh, tell my team, like, you have to, Think bold, but build in an incremental manner, right? If you're thinking all within the system constraints, you will always like look at a 5% increment, but I'm looking at a 10x increment, right? 5% doesn't help me, right? 
So how do you actually think beyond your current constraints, right? It's very, very important there because otherwise things wouldn't change, right? Um, for example, right, at Flipkart, when we launched Big Billion Days, actually that was perhaps the biggest experiment that we did. And it did wonders, right? Uh, it opened up the entire e-commerce market. If we had not done the big billion days in 2014, regardless of the fact that we crashed and burned, I don't think e-commerce would be in this in the state that it is today, right? It was a big, big uh, like inflection point at that point of time, right? Similarly, we at Flipkart also have tried out multiple different things. Sometimes they might not work as well. Ping, a very classic example, right? If, how, how many of you guys have used Ping? You've used, okay? You have used, okay. So, ping, yeah, right. It was our big bet that social shopping is the next frontier, right. It didn't work out. It's fine, right. But we pushed the boundaries, right. Uh, nobody had even imagined shopping in a social way that way, right. But you got a ton of learnings, right. And you will see us now coming back again, right. Not on the social shopping side of things because my team is working on chatbots, right. We have incorporated a lot of those learnings and now we are moving ahead, right? It helps you to kind of keep moving ahead, right? User experience, uh, I'll paint a different picture first, right? Sometimes what people believe is user experience is only about the, the apps, the website, the mobile web and all of those channels. Not quite, right? If you look at a complex organization like Flipkart, right? There are a lot of category merchandisers using certain merchandising tools as well, right? Now think about them, right? If if you create a very uh, like shabby tool, right, which is not even usable, they will make a lot of errors. If they make a lot of errors, it will go to production and impact your user experience. If the user experience actually gets impacted, obviously your conversion goes down, right? So a lot of other internal tools sometimes get neglected. Right? When we are building products, right, uh, you are trying to build self-serve tools, etc. If you are neglecting those pieces, it might often like translate into a bad end user experience. So always keep that in mind. Right? It's, for that, it's very important for all of us to remember who the user is. Many times we don't focus on the user, right? especially when building out internal tools. Okay, I build the platform capability, internal tool will work as per the platform capability. Not quite, right? Because you need to think about who is going to use it, right? You need to figure out, okay, if someone is creating an offer, right, uh, on the platform, then what are the steps that that person has to go through? That person also has a lot of friction points to overcome. How can you reduce those friction points, right? So they are also users. So it's not just the end user. There can be a lot of internal users also, which we should not forget. I don't think I need to uh, kind of uh, state the importance of this. Um, perhaps uh, your for product managers decision making is part and parcel of your life, right? And you cannot actually do a good job on the decision making side of things if you are not very comfortable with data. So when you talk about data, uh, it starts with multiple things, right? First thing, when you launch a product, have you actually thought about the data instrumentation side of things? The first miss that happens from product managers, right? data becomes an afterthought, right? You will not have thought about the fact that, oh, this tracking instrumentation I should have actually put in. They have launched the product and then they will figure out, oh, when I ask a question like, okay, tell me how this is faring, oh, this is actually not instrumented, right? Classic miss there, right? So you need to, data cannot be an afterthought. You need to think about the data instrumentation when you are actually building out the product. That's one. Once you have built it out, the next thing is, can you actually pull the data, right? Uh, be that from your uh, tools like Omniture, Google Analytics and all of that, uh, slice and dice the data as well to figure out patterns and insights and all of that. Uh, but sometimes querying the data as well uh, is a big one, right? I think this is one thing where I myself have kind of uh, had to put in a lot of effort, right? Uh, when I joined TripAdvisor, um, I was not at all good with this. I'll be very honest and frank, right? And I figured out like, okay, if I am not good at this, I don't think I can scale up as a good PM, right? It's very, very important, right? The first thing that I did, and they were, they were kind of uh, uh, like at TripAdvisor, there used to be kind of uh, limited data analysis at that point. The data analysis that used to go in was a bit at the aggregate levels only, the deeper level analysis 
if you can do it do it but there are very few people who could do it right so i learned up right uh, from sql to hive queries and all of that learned it up got a dev box right a full power dev box right and then started kind of really churning out queries and stuff really understanding user behavior a lot of my understanding of tripadvisor's user behavior came by actually querying the data myself nobody had asked me to do it but it helped me with a lot of insights right um, and it led to a lot of new features that i could think about right or uh, because i could actually now start identifying oh these are the friction points that are happening okay people are entering dates but then something else is not happening right so all of those analysis started coming up and but then actually i fell into a trap as well because people soon realized oh this guy actually can pull a lot of data right so people started kind of coming coming to me for all their data requests so also kind of make sure you don't land up into that kind of a trap um another big part right uh, communication uh, you will be at the center of everything you don't have any authority of over anyone but you are expected to influence everyone if you're not good at on the communication front that wouldn't happen right uh, so on communication there are two things one is it has to be clear and articulate second it has to be regular right that, those are two things uh, if you're not clear and articulate people wouldn't get what you're trying to uh, say if you're not regular again people will keep kind of sending you stinkers sometime hey what's the progress on this what's going on this and that right so you need to kind of this is kind of goes hand in hand with your stakeholder management as well and if you look at all your stakeholders it it can be all the way from your leadership to your manager to your peers on the product side engineering side design all of that combined right so you will be working with multiple stakeholders so communication becomes very very important but again you cannot cannot not listen right because again yeah sorry yeah which is why i said that very first thing right you need to when you're starting off right if you invest 50% of your effort in that first 10% of your journey you wouldn't land into those situations right mostly that's the problem that we all encounter right and you are absolutely right right many times there are situations right which is why i have now changed my stance right which is like i'll invest 50% of my effort in that first 10% just to make sure everybody is crystal clear on what we are going to do right if we do that the rest they will do it i don't need to like really spoon feed them on how to code and stuff like that it's just that first 10% usually is the most ambiguous phase and if we are not able to drive that clarity during that phase then it becomes very very important uh, very difficult later on in the journey and you will land into these kind of situations right so my stance always has been focus on that first ten percent so on the listening part two things uh, one is you cannot think of all the possible flows or the ideas and stuff accept it right uh, as much as i would like to believe that i am the best out here no i am not uh, let's be very honest and i accept that uh, which is why it's important to have a very good listening skill set as well because many other people come up with a lot of good ideas or can actually influence the way you have thought about it right um, again on the flip card side it's a maze of different system and each one talking to each other right? it's, it's it's impossible for someone to figure out how each of the systems work and what all are the possible use cases possible flows etc etc right so it's very important to actually have that listening skill set right so that you are actually focusing on the fact that okay someone else also has a valid point of view right it helps you to kind of think better right so look at it that way uh, sometimes we also feel like oh we get into a defensive mode right it seems like someone is challenging my opinion no it's not look at it the positive way that someone is helping me to improve on my thinking so what's the harm right the other part on product on the skill uh, listening side is on the feedback piece right be that from your manager be that from your peers be that from someone else right it helps product managers to grow seek feedback proactively from your peers from upwards from downwards right in my one on one sessions 
I don't talk anything about work, right? I just first say, okay, if you are expecting me to give you feedback, first you should give me feedback. Only then I will talk, right? Uh, otherwise, no feedback for you. First you give me feedback, right? So it helps you to always be on the right track. Uh, curiosity, I think that's another one, right? Uh, sometimes, especially when you're working in bigger environments, right? Many people come up with, oh no, this happens because of this, right? I know that, right? Go deep to understand that assumption, right? Because many times there are finer points associated with it as well, which are missed, right? If you just go by the fact, oh, this person is an expert in that domain and this person said it, so it must be true, right? And don't even look at it, it can bite you later. Make sure you understand, sorry, yeah. 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 So, tr instead of understanding exactly the very specific thing that that person is saying, try to understand where that person is actually coming from, right? Where their assumptions are or their calculations are also coming from, right? So if you break that down, so if say someone says, okay, the compute power required for running this kind of a job is this much, right? Okay, I don't want to question that, fair enough. Tell me how did you arrive at the calculation of compute power, right? Break it down to smaller, smaller steps, right? There's certain things which you know, okay, this person will say, okay, these are so many jobs that I'll have to run. For each job, this is the thing and all of that, right? And break it down. Okay, so many jobs from which all systems are you talking about? What kind of jobs are you talking about? Right? If you go, if you break it down, you will see there are a lot of pieces wherein you actually have an idea. Right? It's usually uh, from on the engineering side, I've seen like sometimes we get scared when uh, someone throws that big term in front of you, right? Which you have no idea about, and say, oh, like, okay, you are the expert. Go ahead, watch, right? Just make an effort to understand. It's not complex. It's not that hard. Believe me. Believe me. Right? I don't even have a CS background, by the way. Right? And I work on performance related stuff. I actually grill my engineers on performance related stuff. Right? So, in fact, I take engineering rounds, by the way. Right? In interviews. Right? So, this is why it's not complex at all. It, you just have to break it down. Just break it down to smaller components. Right? And it's, it's just about you understanding, right? And there's no point uh, in enhancing your knowledge. You're not try trying to challenge someone's numbers, right? You're just trying to understand better, right? If someone says, okay, the throughput is this, right? And the latencies are that, right? 99th percentile uh, and this and that, uh, latency is this much. Uh, sometimes we can be a bit overwhelmed, right? But uh, someone says, oh, I have to implement the 429 for this. And you're like, oh, what 429 out here, right? Nothing to be afraid of, right? Just try to understand and you'll see like what, like the moment you're trying to kind of break it down into lingo that you can understand, right? That's pretty much your job. Right? There's no harm, right? The only thing is don't step back, step forward, try to understand and you'll see those are kind of very smaller components which you can actually understand. It's no rocket science at all, right? Again, for product managers, um, Sometimes there will be situations wherein you are sitting in front of a lot of people, uh, some senior leadership, etc., etc., right? Again, part and parcel of our lives. You are expected to speak up. That's the expectation. If you're not speaking up, maybe someone else is going to give someone feedback later on. You'll get that feedback. You are expected to speak up. All right? And speak up uh, to actually present your point of view, right? Uh, because as a product manager, you're supposed to have a point of view, right? But at the same time, without disrespecting someone else, right? And which has been my biggest learning, right? Um, I have got that feedback myself in the past, right? That, hey, sometimes, like, you present a very good point of view, but you sometimes appear to be very abrasive, right? And I've got that feedback and I've worked on that a lot, right? Because the big thing which changed in my mind was, like someone is trying to help me, there's no, nobody's kind of trying to harm me here, right? So why am I being in a defensive mode? There's no reason for me to, to be in a defensive mode. Uh, let's just try to understand what that person is actually saying, but I shouldn't be afraid of saying what I believe in, right? 
and the person uh, i am expecting the other person also to listen if both people are kind of with a coming with a listening mindset then you're all good right so don't be afraid to speak up many times i've seen product managers becoming a, there are some people who who might actually have an extrovert kind of a personality for them it comes naturally but uh, a lot of us are introverts as well right and uh, especially uh, when you have an introvert kind of a uh, personality you get into a defensive mode very quickly right uh, so don't get into a defensive mode always try to figure out okay it's all fine i know my stuff so that's why i'm presenting a point of view right so as i said like product managers are problem solvers right at the end of the day and uh, your job is not complete till the problem is solved right uh, so many times you will launch a v0 and a v1 and forget about it no there can be a v2 as well can be a v3 as well can, can be a v10 as well right you, until unless your problem gets solved your job is not complete right so think with that right that's how an entrepreneur also goes after it right uh, you start off with something so my first uh, attempt at starting up in 2008 we started off with uh the problem that we were trying to go after was in the employer branding space right from there we pivoted three four times right finally to come to something around the online educational services domain with a online career fair kind of a platform right uh, multiple different iterations are required right to also straighten your thought process right many times you yourself haven't uh, clarified a lot of the thoughts right so always think like that and again needless to say but if you're not having fun while building the product it will show up in the product right uh, either something will break or the user experience is going to be very bad right so try to have fun in the process right uh, sometimes we stress out right uh, and that's not a healthy thing to have right uh, because again if you're building something out there's a joy of building right uh, if that joy is taken out then what you are building also wouldn't be that great right uh, think about when you are doing say gardening or something like that as your hobby right if someone is stressing you out on that i don't think you will be doing a good job at gardening as well right so similar kind of a thought right how many how many items how many numbers do you think uh, you have covered so far that's very good give me a count okay good <laughs> all right uh, again you'll be working in a team so keep that in mind and help one another right it's very important um, we all should accept the fact that when something is a success it's a collective credit if something is a failure it's a collective responsibility right um i think this is something which i've seen a bit more in india than uh, in other in the us i would say um maybe it's because of the environment in which we have grown uh, it's a bit of a cutthroat competition right which is where that credit taking and all of that comes in a bit right uh, in product management doesn't work out in the long run right because people would know that you alone couldn't have built it it's very simple right uh, unless and until you are a one man startup you alone couldn't have built it so try to help one another everyone is in, in it and you need to kind of help the other one, other person also succeed uh, for example in our performance evaluations right if i am putting someone up for a promotion that person has to be has to be recommended by his or her engineering counterpart without that it won't go and that's the expectation which i set right if your engineering counterpart doesn't give you a thumbs up don't even come to me because it has to be, it's it's the other way around as well my engineering counterpart does the same with his team as well right the product counterpart needs to give a thumbs up right without that it's very very difficult from a career point of view again and not just for product management careers but across the board nobody else career uh, like cares about your career more than you do if you are thinking that your manager would no sorry uh, it's it's just you and you you only right uh, so you need to be self motivated uh, self aware first of all know exactly where your areas of development are and accordingly build your skill sets right going forward 
uh, it's very very important uh, because without that uh, it becomes challenging in the long run okay so you've done with 15 right okay i'll give you a bonus one right <laughs> uh, so never let it'll be interacting with a lot of people right uh, if 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 those conversations are not good then again it it leaves a very bad taste in your mouth for a lifetime right uh, so don't ever uh, do anything which the other person uh, will kind of really uh, not take it well so which or you might be regretting later on so uh, something to keep in mind and again not just for product but for product especially given the fact that you will be dealing with so many different people it becomes even more important all right uh, so yeah so i think uh, that's one of the things to keep in mind uh, i had a few uh, i think on the email that madhurva sent uh, she talked a bit about career as well so i added a few more slides a couple of slides only so it will take a lot of time uh, i think you you're familiar with this yeah so i'll give you a different perspective on this one so this is what you had seen so far and the perspective that i'm bringing in front of you is you actually need to bring everyone here with like if you it's the engineering person the business person the designer right everyone should be at the intersection only then magic happens right otherwise it will always be kind of i think so you think something else right the moment everyone is at this intersection that's when magical products happen right so final kind of summary kind of stuff uh, for a pm a lot about strategizing right being aware of market trends what's going on in the market not just in your domain but in the area of technology overall being very creative in your thought process and creative doesn't mean you need to send a tesla to uh, the so of it right no like it, it it's not that far as well uh it's about having a slightly different way of looking at the problem right um execution again very very important for product managers you will have to do anything absolutely anything uh not being unethical of course uh but uh, you need to do anything uh to ship the product out and to solve that problem right? that's the core job of a product manager again a lot of uh, areas where you have to drive consensus and uh, be able to kind of influence a lot of people right because your there's a span of control there's a span of influence right your span of control is going to be very small the span of influence needs to be large right so that's the other other part and communication as i said right you need to communicate clearly and regularly i think that starts few changes to the statement you are not the ceo you are the owner not of the product of the problem right you are a problem solver right so always keep that in mind until unless you have solved that problem uh it's not uh, the job hasn't yet been done and in terms of your career right, i think someone asked this question about the career as well right uh i think you'll hear a lot of uh, good stories right about people rising up rising up and stuff it's not that glorified also right there will be stages wherein you might not see growth right it's not a linear thing right except it it's not going to be linear right uh, at at during some phases you will grow very fast then again a bit of stagnation can kick in uh, and again then you will have to kind of uh, then you will grow right and it's also a function about of how uh, you are updating your skill sets right for example right now ml ai they are all the buzzwords right um, if you are not upskilling yourself all right then again you will stagnate you will always have to keep learning right so that's the other part to keep in mind for product especially since the technology space is evolving at such a fast pace if you are not keeping up right then it can stagnate so it's very very important that we all keep learning and i wanted to leave you with this which is uh, for product managers i think this is this is what differentiates good from the bad right uh, it's all about the decisions that we take right decisions about what to build how to build when to build right uh, if you're not taking those right decisions um uh, then again it's 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 hard to actually stand out the best product managers i would say get those three things right uh, right so decision making is very very crucial 
and the more you are in uh, in the shoes of kind of making decisions every day because we would make decisions every day right uh, so you need to kind of master that process of decision making how fast can you make a decision uh, how many times are you getting that decision right right those are the things that matter right because many times it will be like something broken in production what should i do right it's you'll have to kind of react very very fast right sometimes it can be like okay in the next two years what what is it that we will focus our energies on right can be a longer term part as well right uh, so it's very very important that we make those right decisions and have a good decision making framework right um, so that's another one and finally i'll leave you with this and i'm happy to take any question i know i've gone over time perhaps so yeah sure yeah yeah Yeah. See, it's 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 less about uh, going deep. It's more about first figuring out: Are you able to understand that whether this uh, this can apply or this can have an impact in the domain that you're working on, right? Uh, today, for example, as I said, like ML AI, they are kind of buzzwords, right? People say, oh, like you need to apply ML, you need to apply an AI thing, like. The moment you go deep, okay, let's understand the problem first. Let's break it down, right? Root optimization, for example, this is like two words, right? You cannot say apply ML to root optimization. Like no way it's going to happen. You need to break down that problem of root optimization into maybe six different sub problems, and then figure out how can you learn, right? What's the framework to use to apply ML, right? It's more about that, right? Uh, being able to really understand uh, when to apply certain things, right? And if you think there is an application. Then you should go to as much depth as it is required for you to figure out that whether you'll be able to make the right decisions on that. See, at the end of the day, as I said, like product building is a lot about decision making, right? If you are not at that depth of knowledge which can enable you to make the right decisions, then you need to kind of keep learning. So you are essentially saying that you learn as much as you understand what are the applications and how do you handle yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, if you're let's say there is a lot of modeling at play, right? And with a lot of accuracy as well, right? Different models generating different accuracy levels as well. Now, is that something which you want to get into? It's your choice, you can. But that can be done by someone else as well. That can be done by a well by a machine, right? Uh, that doesn't kind of impact. It's about figuring out, okay, what all, uh, at what level of accuracy, like what's the threshold level for you, right? And to meet that threshold level, which all models are possible candidates, right? How those models work, up to you. You can obviously go into more details, and that can always help you. It wouldn't do you any harm. But at least get to that level of proficiency, which can help you to make decisions. So, one. So, let's say there's a situation, right? When you are faced with, uh, you're given a product to develop or implement in a large company. Yeah. And uh, you analyze and figure out that. This product won't really make as much money as is being projected. So, how do you decide to kill it? How do you decide to kill it? It's not a feasible pro product from a profitability. Like you think the product has been built already, or no? no? Okay, it's, it's being decided, okay. and let's say execution also has kicked off because some preliminary yeah. stuff and all happens. Yeah. So again, as I said, like that first ten percent is very very important to get all of these things ironed out. Not actually addressing all of these in that first 10% of the journey, you will get into these kind of questions, right? And I know we actually get into these kind of questions. It's primarily because of that first 10% hasn't been worked upon very well. Now, uh, one of the kind of templates that I follow, right? Whenever I'm building out, let's say, on the user engagement side of things, right, or on the user experience side of things, right? There's certain themes after which I'm going, right? Let's say performance can be performance optimization. Let's say that's one theme, right? And within performance optimization, right, there can be multiple different tracks, right? For each of the tracks, I would want to figure out, okay, for this particular theme, these are the possible impact areas, right? It can impact my conversion, it can impact my something else, NPS, and all of those particular things, right? On a scale of one to ten, right, ten being the highest and one being perhaps the lowest, right? Uh, how would I score the impact of each of these particular tracks, right? If they are launched, right? Let's say. One track gets a score of seven plus seven plus five, right? So total of seventy. 
uh, total of uh, 90, right? Uh, then you need to figure out, okay, in order to build it, what's the cost in terms of the resources, right? How many dev weeks are we talking about, right? Subtract your impact, subtract your dev, uh, dev cost from the impact, right? You will get some score, right? Hopefully that's not negative, right? Um, now the moment you get a score and you have a stack rank of such scores, it enables you to do better prioritization as well, right? So something like what you're talking about, if you do that early on, right, you know that, okay, this is the effort and this is the return, right? Does it make sense versus what's the opportunity cost? There might be other tracks also. So that's usually a framework that I use. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a question around how much does your competition affect your, uh, you know, role as a product manager? I mean, yeah. I must add that, uh, you know, I tend to balance both your main competition and yeah out from a sense of patriotic duty because yes. it's a Flipkart is an Indian sure. company but sure. I just, just was curious to know how yeah. much does it influence. Yeah. See, I think uh, differs from company to company, I would say that, right? There will be certain companies which are not in a market leadership position, right? There are certain companies which are in a market leadership position. When you're in a market leadership position, you would have an eye on the competition, but you will have a much greater freedom to innovate. Right, which is the situation with Flipkart. We have a market leadership position. Uh, if you go to say a company like, I don't know, like let's say Media. Anyone from Media. Net by any chance? Okay. Uh, Media. Net, right, in the advertising space, right? They're always second fiddle to Google or a big, right, or maybe second or even a third, right? They're not in a position to define the standards of the industry, right? So. There, obviously, you will always try to play catch up to your competition, right? There, looking at competition is prime is perhaps going to be a primary driver towards building out a product. There, the scope of or the freedom of building something on your own or innovating is going to be less, right? Unless the leadership really focuses on the innovation side of things, right? That's how I would look at it. Similar case was in Avery Dennison when I worked, right? The company said, okay, like. Our business has to keep going on what our core business is, but at the same time, we realize the fact there are certain very good technologies that our team is coming up with, our R&D lab, etc., is coming up with. How can we commercialize them? Right? Let's start a separate uh, module of sorts of ten people who can figure that thing out. Right? It's a startup environment within a very big company. Very very few companies have that kind of an environment, but that again fosters a lot of innovation. So, if you haven't read, I think uh, read uh, Clayton Christensen's book on uh, Founder's Dilemma and Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, classic books, uh, and I've been fortunate enough to be taught by him as well. Um, and I think uh, it'll give you a very good idea about uh, models of innovation, right? Models of actually uh, getting innovative products out, right? In companies, uh, like good companies, you will see like 70 or 80 percent of their focus goes on their cash cow business. Remaining 30 percent is always on the next set of products, right? Which can become, which are the bigger bets, right? They would not ever uh, swing the pendulum the other way, right? Um, so yeah, so I think that's how I look at it. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I thought I started off with the first one was customer, right? Yeah. So. As a product manager, you are supposed to be very close to the market, interacting with the customer. So how much your time actually goes into the customer interaction? Yeah, so I think, uh, so just to correct you, like I think started off with that only, uh, but uh, I think a lot of the time actually goes on the customer, but don't forget, so there's a difference that we have between customer and user, right? For us, at least at Flipkart, customer is one who has transacted, user is one who has not yet transacted, right? Uh, for us, both are important actually, right? Because those who are new users coming into Flipkart, uh, bulk of them coming as well, how do I actually make sure that they can move on to make the first transaction, right? Uh, in pretty much whatever we do, 
uh, we keep the customer at the very center of things, right? What that means is also uh, the fact that if you remember one of the slides that I talked about, that uh, your customers can also be your sellers and your uh, internal stakeholders like your category merchandisers, etc. They are also then customers of the product that you are building. So whenever you are building out the product, you should first ask yourself this question, who is going to be using this product, right? Uh, I think that's the starting point. Once you know who the target segment is, right? So, for example, right now we are working on the next 100 million users kind of a project, right? We know very well that, okay, the next wave of users who are going to come in uh, might as well be very different from our current user base. But in what ways? We are still trying to figure that out through user research studies and all of that. And it starts off with the point of how do I define that next 100 million, right? Today if there are 400 million active internet customers and 100 million are maybe shopping online, this is a scope of 300 million. Within that 300, how do I figure out that 100? How do I actually classify that 100 million, the target audience that I'll be going after? It starts off with that. And then figuring out those behaviors, right? In this kind of a case, I need to first figure out who are these users and how are their digital behaviors first different, how are their shopping behaviors different, what influences their shopping behaviors and all of that, right? So that's the starting point of the entire decision making, right? So, and it's part of that problem understanding space or the opportunity understanding space. How much of time actually goes into this kind of decision? Does it matter? A huge part actually, like, uh, like again as a percentage it might be difficult but uh, like maybe half your time would go there. Right, uh, especially since we work on the consumer facing side of things, uh, at least my team works on that, so it's a huge amount of effort that we put in there, right? Uh, which is why, uh, when you have, because without that, it's impossible to build out the right experiences, right? So, for us, it's it's pretty much our bread and butter. Yeah. Sorry, you have been raising your hand for long. I'll, I'll let you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so I think it's it's about first connecting with them as individuals, right? Don't have a transactional relationship with them, right? Many times we have uh, a transactional relationship, okay? I'll, I'll give you the product note, you give me, you build out the product and I'll look at the metrics. Right? If you get to that kind of relationship, it will never happen. So you need to also kind of know them as individuals, right? Okay, this person also has a life, right? This person also might have a family, a girlfriend and might enjoy certain hobbies. Uh, you might want to go out for dinner or go for a movie together, right? Build that bond, right? Only then they will be very receptive, right? To what you are actually uh, kind of working towards, right? And they will give, feed you also with good ideas that way. Right? If you, it's a very transactional relationship, it doesn't hold for a long time. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. I'm, I, I don't think I have an answer to develop empathy because I, I somehow feel it's, it comes naturally to some people. It, it, does not come naturally to some people, right? So let's say if you see an injured dog uh, lying on the roadside, will all of us stop our bikes or cars and attend to it? Perhaps no, right? Answer to it, I'm guessing would be no. Uh, and that's where the empathy side also comes in, right? Uh, I don't think, uh, it's my personal view, I don't think empathy can be developed as such. It's it's a it's a trait of it's a personality trait of sorts, right? There are some people who just connect cannot connect, right? And which is why in terms of our hiring process as well, that's one of the things which we try to bring out, right? It's a very subjective word, but it comes out in the interviews as well, right? Uh, it but it's a very very important part, especially in consumer facing businesses. It's very very important for B two B products etc. You can still live with it because you're talking about of hundreds of thousands of customers, right? But here you're talking about millions, right? So uh, you just cannot live without that empathy side of things. So my personal take is it's, it's hard to develop it. Please let me know if you find out a way to uh, 
develop empathy, but I think it's a personal decision. Yeah, and don't ask me how because we have built out some ways to do it, but yeah. Do what? Rate, okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how much weightage in terms of? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like uh, we look in, into that in a very uh, deep way. Like for example, my day starts off with looking at the App Store reviews. Right? I open it up my uh, Google Play Developer Console and look at all the reviews that have come in in the last uh, like 24 hours. At least the one star and the two star ones. Yeah. 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 I, I, so, our user generated content team actually is working on those pieces, especially on the sentiment analysis, as we call it, right? Being able to classify the sentiment of each review is it positive, is it negative? If it's negative, figuring out those keywords which help me to kind of understand in a broad way, okay, is it is this person talking about the delivery SLA, is this person talking about the quality of the product, is this person talking about the sellers, uh, communication, customer support, what is the user talking about, right? Uh, I don't think we are there yet, uh, it's an active effort that's going on right now uh, on the sentiment analysis. Yeah. Are they? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All the way, actually. All the way, uh, absolutely. Because so at Flipkart we give the PMs a lot of autonomy that way. Uh, our belief always has been get the best folks in and then get out of their way. Right, give them the direction to kind of move ahead and then coach them as and when needed. Right, um, we don't like to micromanage at all uh, because we actually pride ourselves in the fact that uh, we are a company, we are a technology company which really makes some bold decisions. And you've seen that uh, from us. Some have worked, some haven't worked, but that's fine. Uh, we, we, we actually believe in that. So, give a lot of autonomy and the PMs are in full control through the entire life cycle all the way to the point that they are making a decision to sunset a product as well. I have sunset three products, right, ping I had to sunset, right, image search is something which we had launched I had to sunset, uh, barcode search is something which you wouldn't find right now I had to sunset, right. So those are things which is kind of going all the way to sunset also sometimes uh, for product managers this is a very less talked about piece, right, sunsetting products. It's a very difficult piece, believe me, right, because you need to think about a very different set of stakeholders, like your PR, your existing users and all of that, right. When we shut down Ping, uh, we had to think about, okay, there were some active users still, right, uh, maybe in lakhs, but still they were, right, and we had to figure out how to archive all the chats, how could they actually get access to all the chats. What do the customer support agents reply when someone uh, reaches out, right? Uh, Ping had a lot of media hype when it launched, so how do we tackle PR? A lot of those things happen, right? So it's a very important piece that way as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So marketing for us, yeah, so marketing for us, uh, has two major components. One is the brand marketing side of things, which is all about the brand identity, the TVCs that you see, print uh, ATL and BTL basically, the print ad campaigns and all of that, um, and the value prop of uh, bringing that in front of the users and all of that. Digital marketing is the other component, which is about kind of uh, figuring out how to, how much to invest on SEM or which are the keywords to bid on and all of that, the managing all the affiliate partners, all of those pieces, right? Um, yeah, so I think marketing for us is a different piece. They don't get into the product marketing. We don't have a product marketing function. Is that what you're getting at? 
faced a similar situation myself right so before trip advisor if you see right i didn't have any structured product experience right uh, i'd done kind of the same stuff uh, but not under a product manager title be that in my own startup or in every generation right so my strategy at that point of time was first let me get a foot in the door right uh, break through to get into product first is the first thing i was a bit agnostic about the company i was getting into right uh, would i have liked to get into a google yes why not right uh, but at the same time i knew that okay it's going to be hard there right because many companies have very different ways of looking at uh, the product hiring side of things right uh, so i would suggest first try to get a foot in the door and figure out where you can get that if it's a startup fair so so be it right establish your credibility as a product person first uh before kind of going to the slightly bigger companies because slightly bigger companies will have a lot more structured hiring processes right they will go after certain competencies etc and to answer your question there um so we look at certain competencies right it's about uh problem solving as a competency uh product thinking about a uh, competency problem solving is more about okay can you define the problem can you break down a problem in a structured manner do you have a good understanding of metrics and the data side of things right all of that right product thinking is more about the solutioning side of things right when you building out a functionality are you thinking only functional requirements are you also thinking about non functional requirements like performance optimization and things like that right are you actually thinking about uh, uh also building out a service oriented architecture of sorts right getting into the architecture side of things as well then there is a tech orientation part of it right which is more about when you when you how would you actually work with engineers right what's your style there right how do you prioritize amongst different pieces uh getting to understand okay when you're talking about building out systems right what's your approach what are the things that you look at in terms of tech metrics what are the things that you will be looking at right um so all of those get, uh, that get covered in the tech orientation piece of it then there is a business understanding part as well right which is more about understanding of the metrics side of things understanding of the strategic uh, knowledge part of it can you think in a strategic manner right uh, kind of are you aware about the business trends that are going on in the market in this space and all of that how do you handle or tackle some of these business challenges and all of those things right yeah so i think uh, frankly speaking we are a bit agnostic uh, to your degree or to your prior experience to a large extent right um uh, we have a bar and it's an absolute bar right it's not a relative bar as long as you're meeting that bar right you're in right uh, for us that's the thing but i think for product companies the problem is like in the very first phase of getting it getting shortlisted for an interview that's where a lot of bias comes in to look at okay does this person actually have some product experience or not that's where it breaks down right which is why i'm saying ki try to get your like get, get through your network to get a foot in the door first right uh, and that's what i did with trip advisor like i reached out to my mentor adam who used to head product and i was like hey like what do you suggest right i'm looking out for certain thing i didn't say i want to get into trip advisor or something 
and he's like hey like uh, why don't you give it a shot and three four days all the process is completed and he's got an offer right uh, so there are some some companies who are looking for the attitude side of it right being able to uh, like have that go getter attitude and kind of really get it done right they would care less about your background and this and that they would care a lot more about okay this guy has good references and stuff like that let's bring this person in there are some other companies who will kind of always go by the process side of thing and it's mostly the mature companies uh, if you go to uh, google or uh, linkedin or flipkart also i would say i would count in that right we have gotten into more of that right now right so yeah i think i don't know if that answers yeah so yeah Again, it differs from interviews to interviews, right? And different interviewers have different styles as well. Uh, the best thing is to kind of ask those clarifying questions up front. Like, what are you expecting me to do, right? What's the objective that you're asking me to kind of go after? Is it about building out the solution? Is it about critiquing, it, critiquing something? Is it about analyzing certain data? Like, what are you expecting? And it's an absolutely valid question to ask, right? Uh, I actually give extra points to people who ask a lot of clarifying questions up front because they're trying to understand what they're going after, right? Yeah, absolutely. Which is what I'm saying, right? Try to understand what this person is actually asking you to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, sorry. I, 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 so, I, I, yeah. I, okay. Sorry. Yeah. You all said the mic. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. So uh, I am myself a user who has uh, subconsciously transitioned from Flipkart to Amazon. Okay. No, I, I, I acknowledge that. And I remember there were times when the first. I don't think it was subconsciously, but you can. It be was. Honest. It is definitely subconsciously. Uh, I didn't notice. Sure. It's only when I am talking here. Sure. Yeah. So I used to open Flipkart.com first, and yeah. now I op open Amazon.in first. Fair. Okay. So uh, the question is a slightly extension of what you actually said about the acquisition of new users. Hmm. Okay. So, what about the retention of the existing users that you have? Yeah. And there are a couple of things which I see that Amazon is doing. Yeah. Amazon is essentially getting into the houses of everybody yeah. by their Fire Stick yeah. and uh, the Amazon Echo. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I believe them that that's a good move and that gives them a good advantage over you. They can yeah. kind of uh, you know the wallet is already set up. They will take a consent that I will replenish your. Uh, Grocery every month, the moment it is about to get over. Yeah. So they have an advantage. So what exactly is going on? Yeah. Sure. So I think uh, I think there was an earlier question also on Amazon uh, our strategy against Amazon. I think that's what you are going to ask, I guess, right? I think this is your asked question. Really. Uh, so maybe I'll just talk a bit about uh, how we are thinking about things, right? So uh, in e-commerce today, right, uh, there are certain categories which have a much greater penetration online for shopping online versus other categories, right? Like mobiles, for example, uh, almost 40 to 50 percent of the mobile, not 40 to 50 percent, yeah, close to around 40 percent of the mobile units bought in India are online, through online, right? So far higher penetration versus something like groceries, very, very small, evolving, very fast evolving, right? Uh, versus something like, let's say, medicines, no penetration at all, right? Uh, so we look at that first. Right. Which categories have those macro trends working for them uh, to drive kind of internet like shopping online shopping penetration? So that's one. The second thing which we look at uh, is the fact: okay, how are we positioned in terms of market leadership for each of the verticals that we play in? Right, and we play in multiple like hundreds of verticals. Right, for each of the vertical, we take a stance. Right. There are certain verticals which are far more critical for us versus certain other verticals, right? Um, primarily because from a margin point of view and all of that. Uh, so there again, uh, we try to make sure we are in a leadership position compared to the competition, right? When I say leadership position, usually it's at least double the market share. Then we look at it from a customer angle as well, right? We have the different customer pockets, right? 
uh, both from a location point of view like metro tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 and beyond from a SEC point of view as well, SEC, ABC and all of that and where are we lagging and where are we actually gaining, right. Today's situation if you ask me like on the metros, uh, metro population and like yourself there are a lot of users who have shifted to Amazon but I think of recent, uh, in the recent days we are also seeing that reverse thing also happening right coming back again after having switched from Amazon and coming back to Flipkart again. Still a long way for us to cover and if you look at it there were certain decisions that we made in 2015 which didn't work in our favor. Uh, for example, we switched from uh, yeah like well we never may got to app only but yeah shutting not shutting down the desktop, desktop also but we made a very clear point of being mobile first and mobile only to a large extent right. Uh, big backlash obviously and it had an impact. Um, apart from that as we scaled up uh, right we weren't able to hold our promises on the delivery SLA side of things as well uh, which definitely matters to this kind of an audience which cares a lot more about convenience than maybe another deal right. Um, and for any company there are certain growing pains right uh, and both from an organizational point of view as well as from these kind of uh, things right. Uh, so 2015-2016 was a lot about that for us and it was kind of a real struggle for survival at that point of time, right. Uh, but we have turned around and turned around in a massive manner, right. Um, because we have really figured out what are the key things to focus on, uh, certain key things always, right. This is what I am saying, right, decision making is very, very key, right. You need to figure out, okay, what are the things to actually focus on at this point of time. There are certain key things at that point of time we were trying to, we were almost losing our market leadership on mobiles as well at one point of time if you remember right, a lot of launches were happening on Amazon right, uh, no more right, we, we figured out okay the mobiles was a big part of our revenue right and suddenly if that is attacked the entire company's uh, sustenance is at stake right, uh, so we address that first right, like forget everything just address that. So there are certain decisions that we have taken at different points of time. Now is the time wherein we are in a very good situation from a financials point of view. We have cut down a lot on our uh, cash burns, etc. We have uh, in a very good uh, financial uh, side, on a very good market leadership side, um, a very good uh, kind of uh, on each of the verticals as well. Uh, but we are kind of a bit poor on the uh, customer retention side of things as well, which is what you are calling out. Uh, which is why this user engagement team that I am talking about never used to exist earlier in, in Flipkart. It was a lot about user acquisition, customer acquisition, right. Now we are doubling down our focus on these things, right, on the customer lifetime value and stuff, looking at it from a data point of view as well, which customers to go after, how do I actually get them back and stuff like that. The other thing that you raised about Eco and Alexa and stuff like that, see these are kind of technology uh, enhancements, right. For any technology, right, there is uh, experimentation phase as a deployment phase and then there is a scale up phase, right. I believe a lot of it is right now in the deployment phase, not in a scale up phase yet, right. How many of you guys have uh, uh, Amazon's Eco? One, right. And this is perhaps the target base for Eco, right. That's what I'm saying, right. Uh, the penetration of all technologies does not happen at that fast of space, right. How many of you guys have used voice search? Anywhere, voice search, Google voice, right. See the number of hands here, right. That is the difference, right. So, you will see on our mobile web version, we actually have voice search, right. So, so those are certain key decisions that you need to make. Um, are we in a position to build out a prime like offering? No, we are not. It is a huge business, right? it is a content business that you are talking about, right. Is that a priority for us? No, right. Uh, I can find out other ways as well. Uh, but again, Amazon, I, I credit them because of building that ecosystem. Absolutely, right. I think a great job done there for sure, right. Uh, in the Indian market, will it work? Time will tell. Uh, not all markets are the same. Right. Have you used uh, Flipkart groceries? 
browse through when i browse through it uh, i see products which i don't need uh, sure right the products that i need don't really uh, are not really there on the yeah. Yeah. grocery side so sure and again grocery is a very new business for us we are scaling it up uh, i think we just launched 2 3 months ago okay. uh, in terms of uh, numbers we have had an amazing response to it right it surpassed our expectations right uh, like the response has been such that i'm sure somewhere in the competition they might might be thinking hard as to what just happened okay it's been amazing so but the products that you have launched like for example the billion yeah. billion phone and all that yeah. right uh, what personally i felt and i use a billion phone okay, oh, okay. i use okay. a billion phone because it was made in india i wanted to okay. buy something made yeah. in india but I, i i personally felt it was a little bit over promised uh, under delivered There the, but there was a big opportunity that you had and i didn't see anything after yeah. after billion coming anything coming else you will see i think uh, see i think with billion the thing is also about we are using a lot of the data that is being generated to feed into our product development process as well right um, and obviously making in india and all of that right uh, it's again to kind of hit the nail right on, on the first time it's hard for when you're building out a hardware product as well Uh, I think overall, I would say the uh, the response has been so-so for us. Uh, we know what are the things that we need to do better on, and uh, actively working on that. Right? If you look at before the Pixel, right? There have been so many variations of Google as well, right? Starting from Nexus to a lot of other uh, devices as well, and now Pixel has happened. So it takes time, right? Uh, as long as you focus on it. And as long as you know that okay, this is something which I am really investing into, right? It's not a fire and forget kind of a thing, right? If that's the thing, let's not do it. Like if you are invested in the longer term, right? Go all out and build incrementally. There is always that's that's all about product development. You cannot, if you are not ashamed by your first release, then something else is wrong. You didn't hit the market soon enough, right? Yes, we are ashamed. So we hit the but we hit the market soon enough, right? Uh, Yeah, that's my take. Uh, um, according to you, what was the reason for the ping to be a failure? What Sorry? ping ping didn't ping. catch up. Yeah, huh. that didn't pack, ca- catch up, right? So what yeah. was the reason for that? Yeah. That is one question. And second yeah. question is um, on the advertising side. Uh, I just just read an article on Flipkart and Amazon, uh, and the advertising of the Amazon actually touches life, and that actually helps. Amazon uh, to have uh, more customer base. That was what that article says. I don't know about sure. it, but as a product manager, do you have a call on that advertisement side as well? Is this it? No. Uh, to answer your second question, the answer is no. Uh, yeah. On the Google search results. Sure. Sure. I'll address each one of these. so to answer your second question uh, we don't have a kind of uh, uh, much of a say in terms of the marketing campaign because our marketing team basically decides on that and they are the experts in that domain we sometimes share our views right that's pretty much like okay we like this part we didn't like that part and all of that uh, for the big billion days core team uh, like they presented to us all of that and we give our feedback on all that's pretty much it but at the end of the day the decision gets taken by the marketing team along with the leadership um to your point on the search engine results side of things um, yes we have gone down right uh, we had gone down even further now we are at least back up by a few ranks primarily because of the fact that if you look at uh, two things have happened one is on the desktop side in 2015 we reduced the amount of focus right um, and obviously if you have reduced your focus to keep doing all of those enhancements it took a toll there right and then what happened was when we launched our desktop channel completely again right we built it on a new technology stack right and it was new technology uh, which was kind of approved from the google side of things but again this is technology which is yet to catch up with the google search side of things so again at google also different teams don't talk to each other right android doesn't talk to chrome and all of that all of those complications are also there right uh, we are working towards that and for example right now we launched uh, our amp version as well our progressive web apps are kind of getting uh, a lot more index there 
search is also about a lot of because it's kind of a black box at the end of the day SEO, right? Maybe absolutely. No, absolutely, you're right. Absolutely, you're right. Uh, especially for people uh, from the metros, we've seen a lot of the behavior coming from laptops and computers and stuff like that. Whereas elsewhere, it's a lot more through your mobile devices, through the apps and all of that. So you're absolutely right, and we have gone down and accepted. Uh, but the thing is also about uh, we have made some technology enhancements, also new technology stacks and all of that. For example, our mobile web version, right, runs on progressive web apps, right? We are the first ones in the world to do it. Right now, there are so many of them. Right, so, when, whenever you are kind of at the very cutting edge of technology, it has its own challenges as well, right? Uh, in terms of adoption and stuff like that, and there will be phases wherein you wouldn't see that much of a, a, a benefit. Uh, for us, the good thing though is a lot of our traffic is direct traffic, right? So we are not over dependent. Like if you go to any travel site, like make my trip and all of those, right? They are over dependent on SEO traffic, right? For us, thankfully, that's not the case. So your first question was uh, ping. ping, sorry. So on the ping side of things, we started off with a big bet, right? That social shopping is going to be the next frontier, right? Versus working uh, user backwards. Uh, to me, I think that was one of the mistakes, right? Uh, we banked on the fact that, okay, in the offline world, shopping is more of a social activity. Right? How can we translate that to the online world? But we forgot the fact that uh, to build the social thing, uh, network building that network is a very important part. So, which means for me to share, right, I need to first get my friend onto ping, which itself is a big friction point. So, I think that's one of the big learnings there. Uh, so, always try to work from the user backwards and be able to figure out all the possible friction points that you might be introducing. So when I came into the consumer side of things, this was actually the first project that was handed over to me to shut down Ping, right? And my point there to the leadership was like, hey, like I think we have built something really good. There are a lot of learnings that have come up. I'll shut down the social side of things, that the buyer to buyer side of things, because I don't see that working out. But don't ask me to shut down the chat side of things, right? So we pivoted from a buyer to buyer chat to a buyer to seller chat and buyer to customer support chat, which is live event today. And now we are working on chatbots. So it's more about understanding the problems that we are going after. For us, the, the reason why we did the buyer seller side of things is because uh, in our user research also we saw quite a few questions that were coming from the user's minds. Whenever you're buying, right? Okay, will the color of this shirt fade away? Will the color of that fade away? And things. there are a lot of questions, right? Okay, why are you charging me that delivery fees? All of those things come up, right? Those are apprehensions. Interestingly, when we saw the buyer and the seller chatting, a lot of chats were in those directions, which is like, hey, can you wave off the delivery fee? Right? And interestingly, the seller actually waved it off, and the buyer just bought it in the next 15 minutes, and then again, he brought back the delivery fee. It's kind of bargaining. Bargaining is very much an Indian thing, right? So those kind of behaviors start getting exhibited. Uh, similarly, on the customer support side as well, there's a lot of anxiety from the customer side, right? Okay, this uh, product was not that great, and think, oh, this product came damaged and stuff like that. You want immediate support, and it actually helps you instead of being on hold sometimes because uh, you need to kind of have that active support. So feedback has been very, very positive on both of those. So that's how we actually uh, think. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you so much, guys. I think it's been a pleasure. Thank you. So what was the uh, what was the one point out of all the fifteen and the bonus points that you shared? What was the one point that key takeaway for anybody? Just one. Empathy. Good listener. Empathy for the customer. Okay, the one the one that I actually took away was you know you got to say what you think because that you know you got to have an opinion an informed opinion and you're expected to to stand for it you know so that's the decision making is based upon that. <laughs>